What's up guys, you're watching Anxiety Land, a show about how I overcame anxiety. When you talk to people about anxiety, they act like it's this irreversible condition that you can't get over. Like people are like, well, you know, just my anxiety. It's like, yeah, but you drink like four Red Bulls a day. The crazy part about anxiety is, I used to be the craziest person that I know, but it seems like the whole modern world has just gotten really, really, really crazy lately. People are fueling themselves from coffee shops, we're constantly on our phones, and we're always trying to get somewhere. It almost seems like a form of mass psychosis to where everyone is crazy, myself included. By the way, I don't wanna make it sound like I'm the one who's like not crazy. Like it almost seems everybody's crazy, except for me. I wanna let you guys know that you can trust me. It's just me with this backdrop right here, looking like a cult leader. I've actually got a plate of acid that I'm gonna give all of you guys. So for me, I found out I had anxiety whenever I was a little kid. I remember my mom told me that I had a mental illness, which is a really great way to be introduced to the fact that you have anxiety, especially in the South. Because in the South, growing up in like the early 2000s, if you had a mental illness, you were just retarded. Like people were just like, oh, that guy has ADD. It's like, mm, poor soul. I actually went on a wild goose chase probably about 12 years ago to get over my anxiety. And the first thing that you discover whenever you're trying to get over anxiety is people wanna medicate you. Like doctors, especially in Western medicine, will be like, here's some pill cereal. What? It's like pill cereal. It's like, what do I do with that? It's a cereal bowl full of pills and we just want you to take it every single morning. And they basically make you comatose, like Jack Nicholson at the end of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Then there's the other way of getting over anxiety to where you literally are dealing with crazy chiropractors. Now, I've met chiropractors who are actually good Good. but then there's also chiropractors that touch your foot and they're like oh your great-grandmother was cursed and it's like wait what and it's like yeah, yeah 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 hang on I'm gonna do something I'm gonna cleanse out your DNA you're like is this scientific and it's like yeah it's quantum physics you're like I'm pretty sure that's not quantum physics and they're like 400 bucks so you kind of start to feel a little hopeless about how you actually do get over anxiety so I struggled with obsessive compulsive disorder social anxiety generalized anxiety and just kind of a cocktail of all of those things at one time most people I know just accept their anxiety and they go through their life to the best of their ability but the problem is is like when you don't actually assess what's causing you anxiety you just get crazier and crazier and crazier and everything starts to scare you like ah it's a bird ah it's a bird's nest ah it's clouds and you're just kind of in this perpetual fight or flight mode so for me with anxiety i became quote unquote obsessed with getting over it like i was really 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 bad i ended up in emergency rooms several times because i thought i was dying and i was screaming at nurses and it turns out that there was nothing wrong with me there was even one point where they tried to put me on an antipsychotic. But what's crazy, I would get so manic that I would have crazy business ideas. Like, yeah, as soon as I blow up as a comedian, I'm gonna own a helicopter business. And people would be like, you're bipolar. I was misdiagnosed with several mental illnesses because I couldn't get to the root of my anxiety because when you leave something unchecked, it just gets worse and worse and worse. So for me, I went on this long, long, long path of trying to figure out what the solution was. I tried cognitive behavioral therapy. I did self-hypnosis. I did neuro-linguistic programming. I tried to become a pickup artist for a little bit. Um, I went through sales training. I did 12-step programs. I went to shaman healers I literally did everything like if you looked at my bookshelf in my apartment you'd be like this guy's a serial killer he has a lot of self-help books you know his teeth are too white and he reads too much Tony Robbins I'm pretty sure he has skeletons buried underneath his floorboards which I do but I still can help you I would do all kinds of things I'd come home from work and I would shout affirmations in the mirror like I'm enough 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 and the neighbors would be like yeah we know can you at least let us go to bed it's 10 30 at night there was a point where I was listening to Tony Robbins so much, I would just be driving in the car with road rage while blaring Tony Robbins. And I'm a very confrontational person when I'm in traffic because there's something about being in your car 
that makes you just rage on people because you're driving a tiny living room down the freeway and other people are also driving a tiny living room down the freeway and when their house gets too close to your house there's something about you that just gets really primal but when I would yell at people they would hear me blaring Tony Robbins so it was just creepy nothing more terrifying than someone tailgating you in traffic with crazy eyes but you hear Joel Osteen's voice just blaring off the speaker like I am who God says I am Long story short, I've done 20 different types of therapy, probably more. I've read over 200 books on self-development and therapy, all the way from Carl Jung, Freud type stuff, to pop psychology, to just self-help with really white smiles. It's like, I can make your life work. I did everything. So these days, I kind of just lean towards the idea that some folks are just born with a propensity towards anxiety. Because the truth of the matter is, is I grew up pretty good. My parents loved each other. That's my mom right there, a sweet Southern Belle. And I've done so many characters based on her archetype. But somewhere around the age of five, obsessive compulsive disorder behavior started to show up. Now, growing up, I actually had obsessive compulsive disorder. And I remember having that for as long as I can, as long as I've been alive, I've had OCD. If you don't know what OCD is, Wikipedia, because it's such a credible source. I know that everybody's like, Wikipedia is not credible. This is a middle finger to all of my high school and college teachers and professors who were like, Matt, Wikipedia is not credible. Then how do you explain this, Mrs. Dunaway? I'm using it on a YouTube video. <laughs> what if she was actually watching this? So Wikipedia defines it as obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD for short, is a mental and behavioral disorder in which Jewel has intrusive thoughts, an obsession, and feels the need to perform certain routines, compulsions repeatedly to relieve the distress caused by the obsession to the extent where it impairs general function. So in layman's terms, the way I would describe it as you get an intrusive thought that's like, do this thing. And if you don't do that thing, it gives you a lot of anxiety. Now, most people with OCD aren't like, yeah, this thought, I need to peel off your skin and it won't leave me alone until I do it. It's not like that. Most people, it's just like, wash your hands, do this, do that, you know? But I do wanna peel off people's skin. I did some weird things because of OCD. Um, I, when I was a little kid, started pissing all over the floor. Yes, I knew it was wrong. No, I don't know why I did it. And yes, my dad was upset with me. <laughs> Smears that cat came up here and took a piss. <laughs> Boy, we're gonna get an analysis done on whether this is human piss or cat piss. <laughs> and I didn't stop peeing on stuff until I became obsessed with the idea of germs. And I became a complete and total germaphobe whenever I was a kid. I would wash my hands so much that they would literally look like an 87 year old man's hands. Like I had Crypt Keeper hands. And at night my dad would fill up the socks with lotion and he would put them over my hands because my hands were just so chapped. Anxiety has this really nasty habit of making you feel like you're in a straitjacket. Like you are in judgment from the world, you're in judgment from your thoughts, you're in judgment from fear, you have a lot of anxiety. And so what happens is when you don't deal with anxiety, you wanna break out. And I think my way of breaking out as a five-year-old with a bowl cut and buck teeth was peeing on my family's furniture, as crazy as that sounds. And I loved to pee on that furniture. I loved it, it meant a lot to me. It still means a lot. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, do that. <laughs> I don't do it anymore. But here's the thing that I've actually realized, okay? If you are in the grip of that mental illness, whatever you love, you will eventually strangle. It's like grabbing a flower and then you just make it wilt in your hand because it's so important to you. So for instance, if I wanted to have good health, I will wash my hands over and over and over again to where you literally destroy your hands. When I was a kid, I had a VHS collection. I was obsessed with movies, but I was so scared of my movie cases getting damaged. So I would wrap the entire movie case in scotch tape. If you are obsessive compulsive disorder and you're in a relationship and the person you're in a relationship with becomes the object of your obsession, you will destroy the relationship because you will squeeze it and hold it so tight that you'll ultimately destroy what you care about which is why it's so paramount to actually not giving in to that thing and realizing that it's just the worst thing that you can actually be listening to. 
The other one that I struggled with was generalized anxiety. Now, generalized anxiety just means you're in perpetual fight or flight. And this one ran in my family. My grandma had the worst anxiety I'd ever seen. She had such bad anxiety that she was creative with it. It was like she had a screenwriter in her head just making up awful scripts of things that could happen. Like, I'd be like, hey, uh, Granny, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna ride my bike, okay? She'd be like, okay, just make sure you don't wear jeans because if your jeans get stuck in the bike chain, it could tear your leg off and then you won't be able to go up the stairs anymore it's like oh wow it was like she my grandma actually wrote the saw movies no i'm kidding she didn't actually write the saw movies but i'm sure the guy who actually wrote the saw movies did have generalized anxiety disorder he was like what would it be like if a key was stuck in my eye and i had to dig it out write that down and then last but not least the other form of anxiety that i struggled with was social anxiety even though I hate social anxiety, it is the reason why I was able to get over all three anxieties. If you want to do something in life, you have to know what your why is. Now, a lot of times people hear this, it's like, know your why, what does that mean? Knowing your why means that there is a reason you want to reach a goal. So if you have a big enough why, I have to get over this issue because, and that why is strong enough, you will find a way to get over it. Growing up, I had really bad social anxiety. And I remember somewhere, it was maybe second, third grade, I started to be terrified to socialize at school. I'd be freaked out by boys my own age. And then as I started to go through puberty, I was terrified of women because not only could boys reject me and not want to be my friend, it was like women's rejection was like the ultimate, like, ugh. Because when you're going through puberty, you're like this gross, you're just a giant zit with buck teeth. You're like, <laughs> and then if you add social anxiety to that, you're like, <laughs> Like it just makes you feel bad about yourself. So I started to believe, and this is like sixth grade that I had this revelation. I thought to myself, I'm never going to be able to procreate with a woman because I am terrified of women. The only way for me to be able to procreate with women is if I, is if I become famous. And I linked that in my head and I was like, I have to find a way to become famous. <laughs> Now at this time, I was already the funny guy. And this became my reason for living was to be funny. Cause this was like my ticket out of jail. I'm like, if I am funny enough, then women will like me. So it became this obsession with having to be funny. And even though I had social anxiety, my why was so strong that I was able to overcome the anxiety because I knew that if I was funny in front of groups of people, that people would like me. So this was my obsession. Now I'm in sixth grade, I'm not doing any drugs. I don't even smoke weed. I don't do any of those things. But this was like a street drug to me. It was like shooting up when I was a junkie. That's what comedy was. The first time I heard laughter, it was like literally a salve just going over me. And I was able to finally just kind of relax. It's like you're in fight or flight mode your entire life. But when you finally get that affirmation or that approval, it kind of just ah, calms you for a minute. Now, of course, anybody who's everybody will tell you that none of that stuff lasts. It lasts until it wears off. And then you just have to keep chasing it because it's another drug. But it was like the first drug of choice. And through the years, I would try other things to quell anxiety. But comedy was the first drug that I ever took. And to this day, it is still the strongest drug. I would do crazy things just to be able to get that laugh. Now, anybody who's ever struggled with addiction will tell you that when you're addicted to something, you throw caution to the wind. Cause and effect does not apply to you. Like rationally, you know, if I do this, this is gonna happen. But you throw all that out the window because when you're in the throes of addiction, you were just like, no, I have to get this thing and I don't care what happens. This is, people go to prison over this. But I didn't do anything too crazy. But my first way to be able to get approval and make people laugh was going inside grocery stores and getting thrown out. First, uh, it's my Uncle Bob. What? No. Serious? Yeah. Hello, Officer Smith. Hello, how are you today? Good. Good. Okay. Move it along, and I'm gonna go find that cop. We'll never make a kick yet. That's what we're trying to do. You we'll need stop. to shut that off now. Okay. 
Yeah. You should have gotten permission before you came in the store. Oh, sorry. We're trying to collect the trap. I said turn it off now. So comedy was kind of the first way to be able to get over social anxiety. Now, the way that's applicable to other people, I would say finding some kind of a purpose of something that you really love to do and focusing on that. That's the quickest temporary fix. And for me, what I started doing was reading a ton of comedian biographies. And the first thing I discovered when I was reading these biographies was comedians are nuts. I would read about these people and I'd be like, oh, these people struggle with the exact same things I do, whether it's Robin Williams or Jim Carrey. And I'd be like, these are my people. So even though I didn't know any comedians because I'm in junior high, I'm in high school, whatever, it was like I felt this kinship and I had a tribe that I hadn't gone into yet. And it was like something to look forward to. I remember reading this thing about Robin Williams and how he had social anxiety. Um, and he would do characters because it would allow him to kind of shield himself from people. And that's exactly what I did. I started working on characters because it allowed me to get out of my own head and sort of get a distance on my own problems because I got a chance to be able to be somebody else. And after doing therapy over the years, I would even take some of the characters that would embody real life situations that I faced from social anxiety. When I was younger, I used to have shaky voice and I created a character called Insecure Thug that would act super, super hard, but then when he would get around the opposite sex, his social anxiety would kick in and he didn't know what to do. Oh, you're making me nervous. I got a freestyle rap for you. Yo, check this out. Look at that girl, look at that girl. She's so damn hot, it's gonna make me hurl. Oh. Oh, damn girl, that ain't make no sense. Yo, are you a doctor? Cause I need a prescription for Xanax. Shaky voice is something that happens to you whenever you just feel a lot of pressure and you're in a public situation. And it's the most embarrassing part of social anxiety. Like somebody's like, hey man, how's it going? And you look confident on the outside and you're like, good. And then you're like, oh man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go disappear and live in the woods for the next 25 years. But once you get to a place to where you can make your voice shake intentionally, it goes away. A lot of times people don't really know why anxiety forms. The general consensus is that there's some kind of disposition to actually having it, but it's also through events that you go through as you're growing up in life. And so even though I had discovered comedy and I was funny, I was still too nervous to get a girlfriend. You couple that with the fact that you have OCD, you're terrified of germs. In growing up, I also had a growing disorder. I would go to a growth doctor once a year and the growth doctor couldn't figure out why I wasn't growing. I had to take testosterone shots just to make me grow. I was a really little guy. Uh, so technically, this is me on steroids. <laughs> So you can imagine how cheated I feel. Like, this is me on roids. Like. So you kind of couple that with the fact that you have a growing disorder, something's communicated to you, there's something wrong with you. And then I had such bad OCD that I would brush my teeth so hard that I remember I rubbed the enamel off my teeth. So I was the size of a pocket watch and I had yellow teeth. I was like a character from a Charles Dickens novel. I was basically Tiny Tim, like your teeth are rotting out of your head like a British reporter and you're like, Mr. Cratchit. I'm just giving you guys, I'm not trying to sound narcissistic and telling this is my story and I just went through all this trauma and it's so sad. I just wanna let you guys know that these are some of the things that created the recipe, the cocktail for anxiety within one's life. And I remember one of the things that planted the seed to me actually getting help and getting therapy was I had a conversation with my mom. And I remember my mom was like, honey, she goes, I honestly think that you have a mental illness. And my mom is so sweet. And at the time, you know, I was just like, no, I don't, I don't have a mental illness. And what happens is when you kind of grow up in the South, you learn this culture of like, I'm just gonna shove my emotions down in my stomach and then I'm gonna beat my kids in 15 years. That's like a way that you do it. I, God bless you for, from the South. I still love the South. I love the South more than I love LA. But as men, we're taught to act like things don't exist. So when my mom was like, honey, I think you have a mental disorder. I was like, no, I don't. And as long as I say I don't, then I don't, you know? Like there's this fear as a guy that you're like, oh, if I admit it, then I'm weak. So I'd be like, no, I don't. 
And people will carry this kind of mentality to their graves. It'll be like, your wife is leaving. You're like, no, she's not. And then you just keep drinking beer. And it's like, women aren't real. And it's like, no, 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 she's real. She's walking out the door. It's like, doesn't exist if I don't acknowledge it. Like there's this weird thing that you do as a guy. And uh, part of it is how we're wired. The other part of it is, is like, emotions are scary, you know? Because you don't want to just become like a pussy. You know what I mean? You don't want to become like the guy that's like just laying his head in his buddy's lap and he's like, hey, it was a hard day. Like women can do that, but guys, it's like, you're a little like, Ugh, you know. So basically all of this came to a head because by the time I was a senior in high school, I started having panic attacks and I, my irrational thinking just got so bizarre. Now I'm a Christian to this day and I was a Christian back then, but I started almost having delusional level paranoia to where I thought that God was out to get me. And basically what happens is like a volcano erupts, you hold something in for too long. By the end of high school, I started having almost delusional level paranoia. I remember that one of the things that I had back then was this fear of God that was not healthy. Now I was a Christian then and I'm still a Christian now. Um, and I believe that there is a healthy reverence and fear towards God, but this was like crazy. You know, this was an obsessive compulsive disorder thought. And I got this crazy idea within my mind that if I did not throw away all of my secular CDs, that God was going to get me. By get, I don't really know exactly what that means, but that God was gonna be like, if you do not throw these Frank Sinatra CDs away, I'm gonna be mad. And so what I did was I actually went out to a field and it's like, you know, when you're in high school, you just listen to everything. It's like Frank Sinatra, Led Zeppelin and Smash Mouth. And you know, I was in a field and I was gonna set these CDs on fire. And I remember I called my pastor and this was like a, a, a you know, I, it was a cell phone, but it was like a flip phone. I called my pastor on this old school flip phone. And I was like, yeah, uh, I'm in a field right now and I'm gonna set these Frank Sinatra CDs on fire. So God's not mad at me. And then I remember my pastor was like, what? He's like, why? And I'm like, so he's not mad at me. And then he goes, Matt, Jesus loves you, but I'm eating dinner with my family. I gotta go. I'm just kidding. No, he was cool. He, uh, you know, said more than that. But these were the kinds of things that I was dealing with. Flash forward to about two years, I'm in college and I start to develop a drinking problem. Now I'm drinking probably like four beers before I go to class because people in crowds are just making me so nervous. I can't really explain it. Um, but I would drink and I would go around the city because that was the only thing that could quell my nerves. And for a lot of people who have social anxiety, they self-medicate, usually with alcohol. And I would just go around the city, I would talk to homeless people, I would take shots. Like I, I was just, a, I was a mess. And so I remember before class in the morning, I would take shots of Sailor Jerry's rum. That was my drink of choice. And I would do it in the shower and I would squirt toothpaste into my mouth. And when I was squirting toothpaste into my mouth, I thought this is gonna keep anyone from knowing that I'm drunk. They won't be able to smell it. But of course you get into class and you're like a Mortal Kombat villain. Your head is just rotating around and people can just smell alcohol coming out of your pores. And I remember there was this kid in my acting class in college that was like, smells like alcohol in here. And I was like, yeah, it's weird. I don't smell anything. But of course, everyone knew it was me. So flash forward maybe a few months after starting college, because I'm a Christian, a damaged one, but a Christian, I joined this campus ministry called Campus Crusade for Christ. And I remember there was this campus crusade leader and he was a really nice guy. He was like, Matt, he goes, I think that you clearly have something going on because every single time that we meet up to talk about the Lord, you smell like alcohol. And I remember I was expecting this guy to judge me. And he goes, maybe you should get some counseling. And then I remember right then and there, that set me on the trajectory to trying to figure out what anxiety is, whether it's a physiological response, whether it's a brain chemistry thing, what it is, whether you can get over it. And that led me to about a 10 year path of doing all kinds of crazy things to try to get over this insane thing that haunted my mind. So guys, if you liked this episode, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment for the algorithm. Do not forget to subscribe, turn on the bell notifications. And this has also been brought to you by Vesby. Make sure you download the Vesby app in your Apple app store, or if you're on Android, download that because that's who sponsored this video. And we also are gonna have merchandise for 
sale. So make sure you tune back in in the next maybe three episodes in, a few episodes in, we're actually gonna be selling t-shirts. So I know it's a little early to be selling merchandise, but I'm like, if you buy this merchandise, you can help me to move into a nicer place. So God bless you guys. Make sure you tune in every Monday, 10 a.m. We're gonna be dropping episodes throughout the week. Subscribe and I'll see you next time. What kind of a movie is this going to be? This a scary be movie. Well, then they you wanna look at my tonsils? Yeah. <laughs>